An outline of the talk will go as follows. We're, I'll say a few words about what physical electronics offers to the surface science community. We'll go an overview of TOF SIMS depth profiling. We'll talk about why would you use TOF SIMS for depth profiling. We'll go into different modes of depth profiling, single beam phase mode and dual beam phased and interleave modes, uh, followed with some conclusions. So a brief uh, word about uh, what physical electronics offers to the surface science community. So FI is a world leader in surface analysis. It offers uh, multiple different types of XPS instruments, OJ, and then uh, SIMS instruments, particularly uh, TOF SIMS instruments and quadrupole SIMS instruments. Uh, so one of the questions might be after seeing this slide is why would you use uh, SIMS for depth profiling versus XPS, OJ, and the other techniques? Uh, well, SIMS offers a, a unique advantage for uh, um, detection limits, so for trace elemental analysis and for uh, isotopic analysis. Those are just some of the uh, big benefits that you can get from uh, using SIMS over XPS and OJ. But today's talk is really going to be comparing uh, Time of flight tof, or time of flight sims to quadrupole and magnetic sector sims. So comparing these two and the different advantages they have uh, and limitations for depth profiling. So let's go into an overview of TOF sims before we get to talking about depth profiling with TOF sims. So this cartoon will play while I talk, but it TOF sims takes a pulsed ion beam down to about and bunches it to about a nanosecond pulse width. And then it bombards the sample surface and then secondary ions are generated and extracted at roughly 3 kV. And as they're extracted at the same nominal energy, they go through the drift spectrometer here through three ESAs and they're energy compensated and they are beginning to time result or time separate the ions based on their mass to charge. So lighter ions will hit the detector first, followed by heavier ones, as you can see here. And then here's this little mass spectra. And you can see the green one corresponding to a larger, heavier, higher mass to charge compared to the blue one. And it just repeats as it rasters over across your sample. And then there's also uh, multiple other ion beams that you can use. We'll talk about those throughout the talk. But that's how TOF SIMS works in a nutshell. Um, some of the information or data you can get from TOF SIMS, as you can see, you can get surface spectra. Um, so you can get good speciation of what's on your sample surface. And um, fragmentation occurs, but you can have um, some uh, molecular information as well as elemental. You can also get uh, ion images. So as the LMIG or analysis beam rasters over the surface, a mass spectrum is generated at every XY pixel. So you can store that and look at the spatial distributions as well as you can do depth profiling. So you can monitor species as a function of depth as well as then all this information is stored. So then you can reconstruct uh, 3D images based off the depth profile and locate their, how their, your species is spatially distributed in depth as well as in X and Y. So a quick word about uh, SIMS, the two main modes of SIMS, static and dynamic. So static SIMS refers to a surface analysis where you're looking at molecular and elemental information from the sample surface of the top 10 to 20 angstroms. And in the static SIMS measurement, your primary, your analysis beam, it uses a very low dose. And so the analysis is complete before uh, a significant fraction of the molecules or the information is destroyed on your sample surface. Compared to dynamic SIMS, where it's generally referred to as depth profiling, people think of it as, but you're removing material with a high uh, analysis beam current and dose of ions, and you're removing them as a function of depth so you can monitor things uh, as they how they're distributed in depth. But SIMS instruments can operate, uh, TOF SIMS instruments can operate both in static and dynamic and quadrupole and magnetic sector SIMS instruments can also operate in these two modes. It's just some instruments are uh, manufactured and designed for geared more towards static SIMS measurements with a low dose pulsed ion beam compared to where dynamic SIMS instruments use a much higher uh, current density current beam to remove material and look at it as a function of depth. So they're made for different applications, but all SIMS instruments can do both static and dynamic SIMS measurements. So why would you use TOF SIMS for depth profiling compared to um, dynamic SIMS, the quadrupole magnetic sector in SIMS instruments? Well, time of flight offers, uh, the mass spectrometer time of flight offers parallel detection of all species. So you're looking at everything coming off the sample. You're not selecting only uh, boron or phosphorus or arsenic or silicon for your analysis. You have everything so you can look at all species coming off. 
Um, it offers high mass resolution at, at high instrument transmission. And so the high mass resolution allows you to separate uh, elements, atomics from moleculars and get and be able to get better detection limits by being able to separate these two species out apart. Um, since we're using pulsed ion beams, uh, charge neutralization is generally easier for um, time of flight SIMS instruments. Um, and as you saw in the first cartoon, you can separate the uh, instruments are equipped with uh, multiple ion beams. So you can use particular analysis beam, uh, one type of beam for analysis and then another type for sputtering. So you can have optimum beams for both sputtering and analysis. You can have multiple beam choices, which I'll show you here in a few slides. And the big thing is retrospective analysis uh, that all your information is stored. So you can look at everything uh, post acquisition. So it's, it can be looked at, TOFSIMS can be looked at as more of a survey technique in that regard. But however, there are some limitations with the TOF SIMS depth profiling is the dynamic range is not as good as using a quadrupolar magnetic sector. Your detection limits are not as good as well. And because we're using pulse dime beams instead of DC, your analysis time has increased. So let's look at these uh, advantages and limitations individually now. So this parallel detection, what does that mean? So all species are acquired at every depth. And so we'll just look at this example here is this uh, chrome nickel alternating uh, film stack. And here's the depth profile of it. You can see the chrome signal, nickel, chrome, nickel alternating. But there's a, you're also getting this depth information that we're monitoring is nickel and chrome, but you can look at the uh, total uh, integrated mass spectrum here. And you can see that you're seeing all species coming off the different isotopes, the silicon species from the substrate. So you get everything coming off at once so you can uh, reprocess the data on the back end to, to create your depth profile. And all secondaries are collected with greater than 50% efficiency. So you get good transmission as well. Another advantage is high mass resolution. And so some people might be thinking what's so important about having high mass resolution. So it allows you to remove interferences. Um, it can improve detection limits by removing that interference. And you can also do uh, peak identification pretty very easily. Uh, example of to showcase what I mean by high mass resolution, we'll look at this uh, 50 kV arsenic implant into silicon. And so before we get into the depth profile, the depth profile is complete and we're looking monitoring for arsenic in this depth profile. And at, arsenic has a mass of a nominal mass of 75, but also within this mass here, you have arsenic at 75. And you also have this interference of this 29 SI, 30 SIO uh, molecular interference here. And so as you monitor these as a function of depth, with TOF SIMS, you're able to separate out because you have high mass resolution. So you can monitor the arsenic peak. And then as well, you can uh, be able to separate out this uh, interference here. But really, if you were not able to separate this interference out and only monitor 75 if you had unit mass resolution, your background uh, detection limits would increase by roughly the factor of 10 without being able to isolate or remove this interference. So having high mass resolution for depth profiling is very beneficial. Another advantage is charge neutralization. Uh, in TOF SIMS, we're using pulsed ion beams. And so compared to quadrupole and the magnetic sector where you have DC ion beams because your analysis beam is your sputter beam. So it's on all the time. Um, and to show what I mean by this pulsed ion beams is we can look at the timing diagram here. So particularly for the phi nanotoff, uh, the sample is at high voltage and your spectrometer is grounded. So then the sample is at high voltage, 3 kV normally. The LMIG fires here, this is a time scale in microseconds, but the time width is not to scale here. So that's roughly a nanosecond pulse width. And then it's extracted. Um, after the initial LMIG pulse, the stage is um, switched to ground. And then an electron beam is turned on for charge compensation while the sample is at ground. Electron beam is turned off, sample extraction goes back up, and the LMIG fires again. And this just repeats. So being able to have this pulse, allows you to dissipate any charge buildup from the analysis or sputter beam. And the benefits is easy uh, insulator analysis. You can do organic and biological samples, and you can do accurate and mobile, uh, confident profiles of mobile ions that are, uh, have uh, issues during, from charging and during the analysis. Um, another advantage is having separate analysis and sputter beams. So being able to decouple the sputter phase from the analysis phase offers high depth resolution with high mass resolution and high or high depth resolution with high spatial resolution. 
And so you can have optimum beams selected for your analysis, as well as optimum beams selected for your sputter beam. Um, so generally in this dual beam approach, you can have your pulse analysis beam. It's generally high energy for the high, high mass resolution and low dose. Whereas your sputter beam, a DC beam, is usually either uh, one of these following species and it's usually low energy for higher depth resolution and at a higher dose to remove material. So the advantage of having all these different analysis beams, you know, the operator has choices. And so commonly used now for the analysis beam is a liquid metal ion beam. And that's uh, generally bismuth, um, a bismuth cluster source is uh, used for the analysis. It's evolved from gallium coming over from FIB and then the gold because it's high cluster selectivity and then now to bismuth here because because of the mass effect, you get uh, much shallower information depth and less fragmentation. And then it also developed, it was a uh, cluster sources such as C60 and argon. And that uh, same, is, uh, same approach still applies here is that you're having less uh, energy per, per uh, nucleon with these large cluster sources. So you, get, uh, you preserve the, sample in, or molecular information of the sample by not destroying it with the, compared to the atomic beams. And that's for the analytical beams. And so moving over, you also have choices for the sputter beams. Generally, a system is uh, equipped with probably three or to four ion beams, as you can see in this cartoon here. And so the operator or the analysis has, user has choice depending on their particular materials application of which beam they want to use to sputter their sample. Um, Oxygen is a reactive ion, so it's generally used to enhance positive ion yields. Uh, cesium has been well known um, and is reactive ion to enhance negative ion yields. It's very popular, those two guns, uh, species, sputtering species are very popular in the semiconductor industry. Um, also argon gas is used for sputtering, it's more of a physical sputtering. And then the same approach applies for these cluster sources. Uh, C60 has been shown very well for mixed materials, um, having more uniform sputter rates between organic and inorganic. And then uh, a more recent development is the gas cluster GCIB argon uh, sputter beams. And those do very well at sputtering organics at very high rates, but not so much for inorganic species. So we've kind of touched upon uh, molecular or atomic ion beams versus molecular. And I just kind of wanted to show, highlight the, the, what the effect in the, of the sample and the damage of using an atomic versus using a cluster source is. So this example here is from Postwana here. It's a molecular dynamic simulation. We have 15 kV gallium sputtered into the sample and you can see this damage here after just one ion implanting into your sample here. And you get this uh, subsurface damage just from this monoatomic. Compared to using 15 kV C60 here, you can see uh, much more uh, sample is removed per sputter event, so higher molecular ion yields and you get less fragmentation, but also you get a much shallower uh, uh, damage from the sputter event. And then an also nice feature of the molecular ion beam is that you can remove that damage by the su next subsequent sputter event. So you can preserve your sample chemistry. So depending on your application and the materials uh, you're analyzing, you, you kind of want to think about what sputter source or species you're using for your analysis. Another advantage to Tofsim step profiling is retrospective analysis. So as the primary ion beam is pulsed over top of the sample, there's a mass spectrum being generated every pixel, X and Y, and that information is stored into the computer. So you can do a lot of data post-processing. So for a, a true survey uh, analysis. And so you have your mass spectrum integrated over uh, the whole entire area and you have your total ion image. And so then you can work uh, based just off your mass spectrum and generate chemical maps or images. So just looking at this peak here, this red one, you can generate and make the chemical map of this mass to charge ratio, or you could, and then as well, you can look at different ones. And you can see how the spatial, the species are spatially distributed um, in your sample. As well, you can work just from the total of the image and just say, look at specific regions of interest and generate mass spectrum based off the, the areas of the image. So it's very powerful as well as you can do depth profiles. And since all this information is stored at each depth, you can reconstruct and play with the different uh, depths and look at images and spectrum at different depths in your sample as well. However, with all those advantages, it sounds really nice uh, to use just TOF SIMS. Why would you use any other technique? But there are some limitations um, with TOF SIMS depth profiling compared to a quadrupole and magnetic sector depth profiling. Uh, your dynamic range is limited by the count rate. Um, so you can't have as high enough high dynamic range 
like six orders of dynamic range is uh, very difficult to achieve. Um, your detection limits are limited as well because 99% of the material you're removing is not analyzed. So every sputter event, that material is thrown away and not analyzed compared to a, a DC uh, beam where your sputter beam and your analysis beam are the same, that you're looking at everything coming off of your sample, just that one species at a time. Um, as Now that we're working with pulsed ion beams, your analysis time is increased because you're switching between beams compared to a DC beam. So moving on to the different modes of depth profiling in TOF sims. So I'm gonna uh, talk about the different modes of it and kind of tie it together with different applications. So hopefully um, we can showcase um, different materials applications with different sputter beams and different um, depth profiling modes in TOF sims depth profiling. So the first one is single beam depth profiling. Um, this mode is uh, of depth profiling is probably is the most technically simple because you're using one beam, so your analysis beam and your sputter beam are the same beam. It's pulsed for the analysis part, and it's a DC beam, so unpulsed um, for the sputter event. So it's phased in between the analysis phase and the sputter phase. Um, some of the limitations, or one last benefit of it is that instead of using two beams, we're using one, and so your beams are automatically aligned. So that makes it very easy for the user in that regard that there's not worried about alignment issues between your sputter and your analysis beam. However, there are some drawbacks uh, to using a single beam um, phase mode for depth profiling is that the you're either choosing from high mass resolution or high depth resolution. It's not a, it's an either or not an and and both. And what I mean by that is that you need high beam energy to generate a very narrow pulse width for high mass resolution. So operating at a high beam energy, you have poor depth resolution. And so now if you want high depth resolution, you need to operate at lower beam energies, but now you have poor mass resolution. So in the single beam approach, it's an either or, but I'll, I'll really have some couple examples here to show you what I mean by uh, poor depth resolution, how that can affect your depth profile. But before we go into that, I wanted to highlight uh, one of the unique features of the uh, uh, NanoTOF, and that is that our sample is biased and our spectrometer is grounded. So um, using in positive mode with a positive LMIC at 5 kV. So instead of it impacting at 5 kV, because your sample is biased at 3 kV, your net impact is 2 kV. And this also affects your impact angle. So depending on your uh, polarity you're in, you can either get an acceleration or a deacceleration of your impact energy. So it's just something to keep aware of so you can operate a slightly higher uh, LMIG energy because of in positive mode because of the deacceleration of the sample bias. And the opposite applies if you're looking at negative species that you'll get an acceleration and a higher impact energy because of the sample bias. So to showcase depth, uh, depth resolution and beam energy, we're gonna look at this depth resolution test sample. It's a NIST 2135C. And it's just an alternating stack of chrome and nickel, not only 60 nanometer um, layer thicknesses, on a silicon substrate. And so our analysis conditions and positive SIMS, our LMIG is analysis beam. We're in phase mode, so our analysis beam is our sputter beam. So we're at 15 kV with the two nanoamp DC current. Our net impact is 12 kV because of the sample bias. And looking at the depth profile, um, chrome is in red and nickel signal is in blue. You can really only possibly make out one, maybe two layers in this because you, your beam uh, energy is so high that you're damaging and disrupting and losing all this depth inf or layer information as a function of depth. So one thing you can do is to lower your impact energy to get higher depth resolution. And so in this case, the LMIG is, our analysis and sputter beam are tuned to 5 kV, but our net impact is actually 2 kV. And so now at operating at a 2 kV impact, you can really see the layers, the different layers in the structure. So chrome, nickel, chrome, nickel alternating throughout. So depending on your application and what you're trying to resolve in depth, you need to keep in mind your impact energy. I mean, this is just an example in phase mode, but it also can be applied to uh, dual beam, which we'll show here in a little bit. But one of the things you might be wondering is how come um, this chrome signal is so weak, or is uh, poor signal intensity here, being a, uh, this chrome nickel stack here. And so is there any way we can improve this by looking at different isotopes or any other tricks? And one of the things uh, that's been studied and well-established is using reactive ion beams, so using oxygen to increase uh, positive ion yields. In this case of single beam where we're not using a, not a reactive ion beam, you can also use um, 
uh, flood the sample surface with oxygen to oxidize the surface during the analysis. And so you can use that uh, flood source or oxygen flood to increase your ion yield and get better signal. And so you can look down, this is with no flood here, you can see about 10 to the two counts uh, for chrome. But now after uh, flooding it, looking at the same species, you can get roughly a, a two orders of magnitude higher uh, signal for this by flooding your surface. As well as you get about uh, order of magnitude, a little over more order of magnitude increase for nickel. So there's just something to keep in aware that uh, depending on what you're using to increase your signal, if it's not there, you can use a, a flood source and other things to improve your ion yields. So moving on to a dual beam depth profile, we'll look at phase modes and interleave modes for different applications here. Um, but a couple words about dual beam depth profiling. So our analysis beam is now separate from our sputter beam. So you can optimize it for uh, mass resolution, current or spatial resolution, as well as optimizing your sputter beam for ion yield, as I just showed here, oxygen for positive, uh, depth resolution and sputter rate. Um, as you can see in the cartoon here, the pulse beam is up is uh, the pulse analysis beam is separate from your sputter beam. And you can choose from bismuth, multiple different cluster sources, depending on what you're doing. And it operates at a high energy and generally at a low dose to preserve your sample chemistry. And then as well for the sputter beam operates in DC mode um, with low energy for higher depth resolution and a high dose to remove material. And then you can select from multiple different species depending on your application. So within depth uh, dual beam, you have two modes of operation phase, which is uh, similar to single beam, except the analysis and, and sputter beam are decoupled. So they fire um, analysis phase, remove material analysis phase, and it just alternates. And then the other mode is called interleave mode and the analysis and sputter beams are both pulsed at the same uh, rep rate and they operate quasi simultaneously. But the downside is that the sputter beam is only on for 50% of that cycle. And the data compared to phase mode is integrated continuously uh, with depth rather than at discrete depths compared to phase. And so now we're going to um, talk about some examples of dual beam depth profiling. So in this first case here, we're going to look at an aerogel. So it's a, a kind of a mixed material um, um, of aluminum silicate aerogel. And I just kind of want to highlight here of the different sputter beams we're going to use. So this is a dual uh, a phase profile. So we're using bismuth for our analysis beam and argon for our 5 kV argon for our sputter beam here. And so it's knowing the material beforehand, it, it works as a really good example here. Uh, to showcase uh, the use of different sputter beams. So looking at the depth profile in the aerogel, you can see the aluminum signal is relatively flat. However, the silicon uh, begins to decrease as the, you go in deeper into the sample and as well as carbon here. And knowing the sample, uh, aluminum and silicon should be uh, pretty uniform throughout the sample as well as carbon. Um, and you see this uh, surface transient here in the sample and another artifact in the profile is this uh, interface is rather broad after the aerogel ends the copper substrate here. And another thing to look at in this profile is that you can see this within the sputter crater here, this optical camera in the SIMS instrument, is that the crater bottom is very dark. So it kind of indicates there's some sputter induced uh, topography being generated during the analysis. And it um, goes inside with uh, the broad interface here as well. And so this is using an atomic uh, beam here. So if we look at it, now using a, a molecular ion beam, a C60 beam, um, and doing the depth profile throughout. You can see just clearly that the aluminum signal is uniform throughout. Um, the surface transient is essentially removed. Um, you can see that the silicon signal as well is uniform throughout the sample, and as well as the carbon here. And you can see the carb or copper building up towards the interface, and you get more significant sharper drop-offs here. So all those point to a, a better depth profile, better information that you're receiving about your sample here. And as well as looking at the sputter crater, you can see it's very, uh, very clear. So not a lot of sputter induced topography compared, roughening compared to the monoatomic beam we used before. And so I just kind of want to um, put this all together. So it really drives it home is that you need to think about what sputter source you're using for your depth profile, depending on your material. Um, in this particular case, uh, argon uh, damaged the surface and, and caused sputter-induced roughening compared to a molecular ion beam in this case. So looking at the depth profile here, doing the ratio of silicon to aluminum, the C60 is the solid line. You can see very uniform compared to the dashed line, which is the argon profile. 
as well as for the carbon signal, and then looking at the uh, profile or sputter craters. So you really need to think about what type of a sputter beam you're using for your material here. So another application, so that was a mixed material. Now we're gonna move over to a, a damselfly example here, so an organic application. So this is the damselfly here, and a big question is uh, scientists have been asking is what's causing these different colors in the wing here? And is there some structure property that's giving rise to this? Is it a chemistry difference? Or just wanted to know if we can learn from nature. So we use this dual beam phased profile for um, to do a depth profile on this damselfly wing. So we use the bismuth three um, for the analysis beam and the sputter source is a 20 kV argon. So GCFV, a large cluster source and a charge comp was used during this analysis because it's organic and non-conductive. And so just these two profiles here. So we have a positive ion profile here. So this is with sputter time on the X axis and intensity on the Y here. And so you can see the amine group here, some of all of these amines and then sodium and potassium. You can see their alternating structure and how it correlates with this um, cross-section view of the wing here. And then as well, we can switch polarities and look at negative profiles. And this can be done very easily to look at uh, particular species that uh, have better positive ion yields and form positive ions better and look at uh, species that form better negative ion yields and learn about the chemistry of the sample here. As well in negative mode, looking at CN and CNO and see how they alternate and what species between the positive and negative uh, correlate in this depth profile here. And so it's very beneficial that you can get the preserve the chemistry of the sample as a function of depth um, using this GCIB on this organic profile. Well, this would be all destroyed, all this chemical information would be destroyed using um, a DC sputter beam, a monoatomic DC sputter beam. And so as I kind of talked about early on, this a retrospective analysis and that Toff Sim stores every, uh, there's a mass spectrum being generated at every X and Y pixel and as a function of depth. So you can reconstruct these uh, profiles 2D profiles into 3D reconstruction prof or 3D image profiles here. So we have the positive profile uh, shown here, this image. We have a wax surface here, and then we can see the am amine, some amines by the sodium and alternating as well here. And then looking at the negative sim, you can see the wax surface as well as the CNO and then CN and how they alternate. And what's really nice is that we have this TM cross section here of the image, and you can really see how well um, the sims correlates with the TEM cross-section image and the, how the depth, uh, having really superb depth resolution, we're able to resolve this and maintain the chemistry throughout the sample. So using uh, two techniques to uh, try to analyze your problem is a, can be very beneficial to learn about your sample. So another application type of depth profiling is interleaved mode. And so interleaved, as I said, is that you're generally operating um, both beams are pulsed, your sputter and your analysis beam. And the sputter beam's only on for 50% of the time. But so what's the benefit here? Can you still do charge comp when you're operating both these beams or both of them are being pulsed at the same time? And the question and the answer is yes. So looking at this time diagram of the interleaves, um, L MIG is operated at five kilohertz. So just like uh, what I showed earlier on, the sample is being at high voltage, the L MIG fires for the extraction. During the flight time, it's turned off and the sputter gun can be turned on and the electron gun can be turned on during the sputtering phase. And all this happens uh, for charge compensation and they can be turned off and then sample extraction is brought up and the LMIG fires and then it, it repeats. So yes, you can do uh, the charge compensation in interleave mode for a higher uh, data point density and looking at insulating material. So this first example of uh, interleaved depth profile is looking at a thick insulator. Um, sodium, and the sample is sodium and lithium implanted into one micron of SiO2 in the silicon. Uh, the analysis conditions is 15 kV indium for the analysis beam and the sputter beam is 10 kV cesium. So a high energy because it's a very deep, uh, deep implant. And just to highlight the analysis time took 53 minutes. So it is a much slower analysis time compared to a uh, quadrupole or magnetic sector. But most people maybe don't appreciate this or not from the semiconductor industry, but sodium and lithium are very mobile ions and suffer from charge uh, driven diffusion during a, a DC sputtering event. So being able to analyze these and uh, have the correct position and accurate profile of these species is very important. And so it looks all pretty right here that all these species are where they're supposed to be at, but 
if you didn't have accurate or good charge compensation, the profile would look like this. And all your sodium would be pushed, sodium and lithium would be pushed to this uh, interface here of the oxide and silicon substrate. So you wouldn't have an accurate information or accurate profile if you didn't have uh, accurate and good charge compensation during it. So just something to be aware of when sputtering these alkali earth metals. And so you can do um, easy charge comp for thick insulating samples, as well as doing um, thin insulating samples and having uh, superb uh, data point density. So this is a this uh, film is a 10 nanometer oxide nitride oxide gate oxide stack. Um, it's using 15 kV gallium for the analysis beam, and our sputter beam is now 1 kV. So you should have much higher depth resolution. And this analysis time only took 10 minutes for this stack. And so as you sputter down through the sample, you can see the surface oxide, this first layer being roughly two nanometers, and it's very easily resolved. And you can see the interface and then the silicon nitride signal increase and then decrease as we go through this final oxide before the substrate material here. So in interleave mode, you can have a very high data point density, so you're not missing any interfaces and operating at low, in, uh, low impact energy for the sputter and you can get high depth resolution. So the next example I'd like to show with this interleave mode of depth profiling is kind of doing a survey depth profile. So looking at the interface between this uh, lithium silicide on silicon. And the big question is, uh, are there any impurities here at this interface? I mean, in this depth profile, we have depth here and intensity. And this is the uh, molysilicon signal here in red and the silicon signal in, in purple here. And so these are the, the um, matrix, matrix markers you can do. So we know we went through the film, but the question is, what's at the interface? Is there any contaminants or anything? And so using this interleads approach, we can uh, pick apart the depth profile and investigate it for impurities, not knowing everything at once. So because of all our information is stored throughout the analysis, not knowing, not selecting certain species at the beginning of the analysis, you can do this on the back end. So looking at the, in the bulk of the film here, we can extract our surface spectra here and we can see that there's some oxygen in there, silicon, silicon nitride, some nitrogen contamination, silicon dimer, trimer, and then the the molysilicon signal here in the bulk of the film. Now, if we look at the interface here and just look at this spectrum, we can see our silicon oxygen signal increased. We now have carbon present, there's some trace amounts of fluorine. We can see these other molecular species, silicon carbide, SiO2, and so on. So now we can say, okay, now there's carbon at the interface. Oxygen looks like it increases in fluorine. So now after the analysis is over, we can look back and say, monitor these species and select them for the depth profile. So now we can reconstruct this depth profile after the analysis, now highlighting oxygen, carbon, fluorine. There's probably possibly some chlorine in there um, as well, but uh, so you can do a depth profile reconstruction and now see how these species um, change as a function of depth and where they're located. Right here at this interface, you see the increase of oxygen, carbon, and fluorine. And because we're in interleave mode, we have very high data point density. So now that we know that the interface wasn't missed because of this data point density compared to a phase profile. Um, another nice aspect of this retrospective analysis for depth profiling is being able to do selected area depth profiles. And what I mean by that is that you can work from the total ion image. In this case, we're looking at a copper grid on aluminum. So this is the copper grid and aluminum substrate is that you can look at the image and uh, select particular areas from the image and only look at signal coming from that and reconstruct and uh, make depth profiles of that. So of this aluminum area here, you can generate and um, only show a depth profile from this or spectra or images, as well as looking just at this copper signal here just from this area and generate a depth profile for that. Where this becomes really beneficial, I mean, maybe not particularly in this example, is if you're doing a depth profile and you look at your uh, profile and it doesn't quite make sense or there's some uh, intense signal that uh, spot that you didn't anticipate like a particle or something is that you can operate uh, retrospectively and then exclude that uh, particle from your depth profile and reconstruct it and eliminate that uh, contamination or a bad area in your profile. So it's very beneficial having all of this uh, data to be able to process retrospectively as well as um, creating spectra and uh, recreating depth profiles, you can also generate images at specific depths as well. So looking at the same total depth profile of this aluminum on copper grid, um, looking at these three dashed dash lines here, 
you can look at these particular uh, times or depths and just look at images of the species from those particular times. So at 40 seconds, you can see these species highlighted here and how they're spatially distributed, as well as at 150 and at uh, 460. So just a very powerful tool, uh, top sims depth profiling is uh, looking at all your data retrospectively instead of knowing everything you wanna look at and analyze beforehand. So in conclusion, I would just like to state that TOFSIMS uh, provides a unique depth profiling capabilities when you wanna monitor all species or you don't know what species you really wanna monitor beforehand that you didn't know were present in your sample. So for more a survey approach, um, you can get high mass resolution. So separating elemental from clusters. Um, if you wanna look at uh, insulating samples because of the pulsed ion beams, uh, charge comp is very easy. As well as uh, looking at uh, species that suffer from charge induced diffusion or, or driven. You can do that very well here, as I showed with the sodium and uh, lithium example, as well as uh, organic and biological samples. The TOFSIMS makes it very easy to do analysis on those because of the charge compensation. So if you are looking at for low impact sputtering, so high depth resolution with high mass resolution or high spatial resolution, then TOFSIMS depth profiling offers a very nice advantage for that. However, conversely, your samples have to have moderate film thicknesses, so roughly a micron, and uh, with modest dynamic range requirements. So hitting the ultimate detection limits and looking at thick films uh, would be best suited for other types of SIMS instruments. 